So I begin by noting that communication is an essential discipline of leadership. And like any other discipline, there is a rigor to effective communication. There is a rigor to doing communication well. And it is a rigor that is equivalent to the rigor that you use in every other process you deploy in your work. What I often find baffling in civilian life and in military life is that leaders who use rigor in every other element of their work throw rigor to the wind when it's time to communicate. And they improvise or they react on impulse and then they're surprised that it doesn't go well. And as a leadership discipline, we need to recognize that there is a rigor to doing communication effectively. And today I want to share some of that rigor. Let me note that I became a professor at New York University 29 years ago. And when I was initially hired to teach graduate students in public relations, the industry had pleaded with NYU to please find some way to make the communicators able to think strategically. So my mission when I went into NYU was to teach strategy to communicators. Since then, I spent as much time teaching communication to strategists. But whether I'm teaching strategy to communicators or communication to strategists, the principles are pretty similar. Now, in 1988, when I started teaching, there was no available reference book on strategy in communication. There now is. It's called The Power of Communication, the book that you guys, uh, some of you are reading. But back then, there was no text on strategy in communication. So I decided to not have to worry about a text on strategy and communication. They already knew communication. I would teach them strategy. But there weren't a lot of books on strategy in 1988 either. So I assigned to the public relations graduate students at New York University, On War by Carl von Clausewitz. <laughs> I can confess that I was not a very popular professor when they opened the book and saw first that it was 700 and something pages. And I, asked, I offer this as lovingly to our German allies. It was written in a very dense 19th century German style. Even in American translation, it was a bit inaccessible. But to their credit, they read it. And there were a number of principles of Clausewitz that we were able to immediately deploy in the professional practice of communication. And there are two principles in particular that we were able to deploy. And the first is the principle of the objective. And one of my complaints at the time about public relations, it was all about activity, but not about aligning that activity with purpose. And so I was able to just take one word or two words in the principle of the objective, and by just modifying that principle with a couple of word changes, make it apply to the professional practice of communication. And the principle of the objective, as you know, is that war is the continuation of policy by other means, and means can never be considered in isolation from their purposes. When we think about it, communication is merely the continuation of business by other means, and means can never be considered in isolation from their purposes. In a military context, I would argue that Communication is the continuation of policy by yet other means. And because means can never be considered in isolation from their purposes, the only effective way to measure communication is to ask, does it move us closer and closer to achieving our purpose? And if there isn't clarity of purpose, my advice to my civilian clients, my advice to my military clients, if you don't have clarity about purpose, don't communicate. If you don't have clarity about purpose, don't communicate. Let me share a story. I have no idea whether this applies in the military. I'll know by your smiles or eye contact whether it does. I am often brought into an organization, a company, an NGO, a government, 
and I'll be asked to assess their communication. And I'll be given something to assess, usually by someone very proud of their work product. So for example, a weekly newsletter. And I'll be asked, what do you think? And I look at it, and I can see right away that it is well designed. The font is readable. The photographs are compelling. When I read it, the prose is quite legible, quite easy to follow. And then I will ask this question. What is the purpose of this newsletter? I already see a smile now. And I'll get the answer. We send it to our employees on Tuesdays. Thank you, Dean. We send it to our employees on Tuesdays. And I'll say, yeah, OK, I get that. But what's it for? And they'll say, well, it's for employees to get on Tuesdays. And I'll ask the same kind of question a few more times, and I'll always get Tuesday as the response. And eventually, I scratch my head. And I say, I don't think Tuesday is a purpose. I don't believe that Tuesday is a purpose. Now, if you tell me that employee productivity is low, and if you tell me that an employee engagement survey has uncovered that employees feel very demoralized because they don't know what's going on in the company, they don't think the company cares about them, then I can say, OK, I get it. This newsletter is intended to have employees learn what's going on and see all the things that the company is doing to make them uh, uh, think that the company cares. I can understand that purpose. And then I can assess the likelihood that this instrument is going to get us closer and closer to that purpose. But Tuesday is never a purpose. I know there's some equivalent in the military. If you can't articulate a purpose that doesn't make reference to the communication itself, my advice is don't communicate. Only communicate when you have a purpose. Only communicate when that purpose is clear. And only communicate in ways that move you closer and closer to the achievement of that purpose. Because means can never be considered in isolation from their purposes. And communication is merely the continuation of policy by yet other means. <clears throat> the second principle, I'm sorry, let me, let me take one step back. If we take seriously that communication is the continuation of policy by yet other means and that you only communicate for a purpose. We then move to the second principle of Clausewitz that my graduate students 29 years ago began to understand, and I offer it to you as well. In On War, Clausewitz describes war as an act of will that is directed toward a living entity that reacts. Just as with the principle of the objective, by changing just a couple of words, we can also have a really good understanding of effective communication. And that is communication is an act of will that is directed toward a living entity that reacts. And we can parse this definition very precisely. So let's do that. The first is communication is an act of will. It is always done on purpose. It is always done for a purpose. It is never done impulsively. It is never done improvisationally. It is never done out of personal preference. But it is always done because it helps us move closer and closer towards the accomplishment of a goal. Second element of this definition, directed toward a living entity. Those with whom we communicate are living, breathing human beings. They have their own attention spans. They have their own levels of understanding and sophistication. They have their own capacities. And we need to recognize that all whom we engage are living, breathing human beings. They are not a collective mass called an audience. And communication doesn't consist of pushing stuff at them. Communication consists of connecting with them, of engaging with them, of moving them. And if we think of communication as sending stuff, then we fail 
We need to see communication as connecting with people and then moving them with us. Those with whom we connect are living, breathing human beings that react. And so the way to assess whether communication was successful is did we get the reaction we had hoped? Does this reaction help us advance towards our goal? Or was there no reaction? Or was the reaction insufficient to move us towards the goal? Because means can never be considered in isolation from their purposes, and communication is merely a means. Communication is an act of will directed towards a living entity that reacts, and we need to take that reaction seriously as a measure of whether we succeed. 